And we're live. It is Wednesday, November 11th, 2020, 501 p.m. Kate just noticed that this is our 230th episode, which means Kate has things to say about Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act um, <laughs> because, you know, we can't pass up an opportunity to do that. It is a hat day. It is a Jonathan Rausch day. It is also a hat day for Jonathan Rausch, apparently. Uh, <clears throat> so, Kate, the monologue is yours. Yes. Well, uh, today is the 230th episode of, of Section 230. No, of, in lieu of fun. There have been many more episodes uh, of Section 230 than 230. Yay! Happy <laughs> birthday and we will find 230 <laughs> 230 um so yesterday i don't know if you saw it but william shatner who is a very old timey um actor he used to be on this space show i can't remember the name of it <laughs> <laughs> um I actually wrote this very funny joke about how great this guy from Star Wars was at summarizing Section 230, and then knew, like, couldn't even, like, I sit, like showed it to John, and I was like, how bad am I going to get dragged for being some dumb, like, young girl that doesn't know what, like, Star Trek is? You know He's that, like, like, you know that Jonathan is, like, a Star Trek maniac, right? I know, I'm teasing him. Okay, right just now. checking. <laughs> but, like... So this is like particular. This is particularly why I'm like calling this out. And so like this. Um, uh, so yesterday, last night, um, William Shatner said, um, "It's not a pu like Crispy Oz. Whoever Crispy Oz said, why should Twitter not be required to adhere the same standard as another publisher?" And he responded in kind of a um, what was up taken up by Section 230 disciples as like, oh, thank you, William Shatner, for understanding us. Of, it's not a publisher, dear. They don't publish information. We do, and we are not its employees. They cannot be held accountable for what idiots post. They have a set of rules that they follow and make us adhere to so as to m allow for maximum enjoyment by as many as possible. And I was like, oh, that's like pretty good. And like, wasn't actually, was like, there's not anything legally incorrect about that like i mean which bright brings me to kind of the end of this monologue which is that like i was thinking how clever it would be if we did 230 different takes on section 230 all of which are legally and factually correct but none of which like but but all of which lead to this massive and colossal chaos over this particular uh particular bill and then i realized that i would maybe be the only person interested in that me and jeff kosef and like who wrote the book about it <laughs> and so like uh, i was like no no that's a bad idea um but but, but wait a minute i want to say that in honor of section 230 today we should all engage in actionable conduct on this show <laughs> for which crowdcast cannot be held liable and uh, and that YouTube also cannot be held liable since it's carrying us and Facebook and Periscope and Twitter cannot be held liable. And it should be stuff that we are confident that we will not be held liable for. So I am going to start. I'm this. just going to say that illegal things they are we and they are still liable for like anything that's against the law. Is no, like, only if it's a criminal law, they can. But like. They have no civil liability. So right, I'm no going to start liability. by libeling the two of you. Oh, great. Um, and um, and uh, <laughs> I'm confident that you will not sue me. And I will point out that this carries no risk for the carrier because, um, uh, you know, Section 230. So I'm going to start with Jonathan. And I am going to say something frankly libelous of Jonathan, which is that he is... He committed treason by uh, uh, by opposing our president, um, and he is uh, what is called technically a treasonous motherfucker, um, and that is uh, actually. Now, I, I'm pretty confident that Jonathan is not going to sue me over that. And by the way, that was said with reckless disregard for the truth, actual malice, because I am aware that Jonathan, in fact, uh, both 
um, has not committed treason and has not Thereby fucked his mother. Out your pub um, should you have one? <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm I'm really confident that what I said was false, um, and um, and it was defamatory. And I'm pretty confident Jonathan will not sue me. But I think in honor of our 230th episode, we should observe that he cannot sue Crowdcast for this. Crowdcast is immune from liability. Now, Kate, it is your turn. Um, I am going to not libel you. I'm going oh, to steal. Oh, my turn to be. Oh. Yes, I'm going to steal your intellectual property and claim credit for having written uh, uh, all of the work associated with the new governors. Um, it's all mine. Kate didn't do any of it. Uh, and actually, um, uh, I, you know, it's, it's my writing. I'm just going to take credit for it. Um, and it wouldn't be the first one. <laughs> <laughs> but let me point out that uh, you cannot sue Crowdcast for this uh, unless you send a takedown notice under the DMCA first. And so I just want to say this is an example of Section 230 at work because it's our 230th episode. We are not allowed to have fun anymore, but we are allowed to have hats. I was going to say, who do I sue about that hat, Ben? No, there's no <laughs> suing over the hat. And Jonathan Rausch, welcome back to the show. Yes. Always nice to come here and be libeled. <laughs> that's that's the goal. <laughs> um, that's so, the tweet. <laughs> all right. Let's start with how you're feeling seven days post-election. You know, I am feeling so relieved that I'm surprised by how relieved I'm feeling. I had readied myself for another possible 2016. And like everybody, I went to bed. Was that on Tuesday night? Or yeah, generally? on Tuesday night. Well, generally, you know, I, I always thought there was a 30%, one in three chance that Trump would squeak through. I thought that was narrowing toward the end because I believe the polls, silly me. Um, but the sense of overwhelming relief, it's, it's, it's not just political, it's, it's psychological, it's emotional, it's like not carrying a burden that I'd become accustomed to over four years. So, so I'm feeling great. I'm not particularly worried about the, the Russian style disinformation campaign that Trump and a lot of Republicans are running right, running right now. And I am impressed with how Joe Biden is carrying himself, comporting himself, as I have been throughout the campaign. It was a tremendously important thing and rare thing for me to see a candidate actually grow in stature over the course of a campaign instead of diminish. So all of that happened, like you, Ben, and the article we co-wrote, we said this, we said what the country needs is, you know, a real ass kicking for the Republicans that they would never try this again. So we didn't get that, but I think what we got was pretty darn good. So I'm feeling great. How are you feeling a week after? I am feeling a little bit anxious about the president's post-election conduct, a little bit anxious about the congressional side of the election results and otherwise and and nervous about the circumstances of the transition which are already rocky and going to get rockier um but otherwise in broad agreement with you how are you feeling yeah Kate? yeah i'm like i mean <clears throat> i am like jonathan i am like surprised at how much better i feel than I thought I was going to feel like the like the vast majority of my of like how of like just how much more energy I've had and how I just feel like everything feels a little bit brighter in this weird way. Um, I'm, it sounds dramatic, but like really, that's kind of why I'm surprised at like at, like, at feeling this way because it just wasn't anticipating and having that big effect on my daily life. Um, but. I'm not, I know I'm like, I'm just not as like some of the things that have happened. I think that it's troubling that Trump is doing all of this kind of everything that he's done in like the past couple of days. Um, 
but I'm not worried about it yet. Uh, I like I am like cautiously unworried. I don't know if that makes. Sense. I'm kind of like if a few if this keeps going and there's a few more firings and it looks still keeps looking this bad, then I will start to really be concerned. But right now, I feel like it's still in the in the in the imprecise, not clear what's going on. This is all very weird, but so ha so too has this entire last four years broken like kind of the mold for everything that I've come to expect about a president. And so I, I don't know, like, I, but maybe that's too blase. I don't know. Well, we don't know yet. Um, I, I, and I projected in explaining my relief, I, I think I projected possibly too much confidence in the inconsequentiality of what Trump is doing right now. And what, what concerns me the most is the disinformation campaign he's running is designed to convince Americans that they'll never know for sure who won the election. And 70% of Republicans already say, according to a to one poll, that they believe the election was not free and fair. And Trump's going to try to convince many of the rest that we'll never really be sure. So that that's troubling. Um, and that is a remarkable figure. I mean, I, I'm curious to see it validated yes. by other pollsters. But... Um, I was amazed by that. You know, it just suggests that uh, there is a, are a very large number of Republicans um, uh, who are, you know, so deep in the media ecosystem that they really don't have information about the numbers. Yeah. I think that that's right. And I think that there's, I think that like, I mean, he kind of convinced those same people that Barack Obama was not born in the United States of America, right? Like, I mean, it's like, so it's kind of, and that one president was entirely illegitimate. He's just trying to do that for the next president, I guess. Um, and I see that as like a little bit, I know this sounds like a bizarre thing to say, but a little bit is like more of the same in which like, it's bad that it's happening, but it's like, okay, this is just his bread and butter. And, you know, and and, and, and yes, and it's I'm, their it's their bread and butter, too. It, it's, yes. it's for me, it's priced in. We now know there is nothing he can say that a majority of Republicans will not believe. Yes. So how do you Absolutely. understand the secretary of state's comments slash joke yesterday? I've watched the video about eight times, and it seems to me that he was clearly joking in some sense when he made that comment. Um, but that the purpose of the joke was to not have to actually answer the question. And that when he is asked about it by Brett Baer on Fox News that evening, he conspicuously doesn't say he was joking. And rather reiterates this will be prepared for anything. So like the whole purpose of it was to avoid having to say, we know who won, it wasn't us, and we're preparing for a transition. How did you understand what Mike Pompeo did the other day, yesterday? I, I didn't understand it. Um, I did read it the same way you did, his body language and his smirk, suggesting it was a joke that popped out of his mouth. And he's, you know, maybe it's the opposite of Trump who says things that he really means, like Russia, if you're listening, or inject bleach. And then when he's called on them, sometimes says he's being sarcastic. Obviously, he's not. So maybe this is the opposite. The guy's being sardonic and then discovered the president liked it. Um, all I can tell you is this, it's an obscenely inappropriate joke, but in this administration, no one, I don't think anyone in the ranks is going to step forward and say that we lost. Do you so, think, I so mean, do you think anyone could? So what's no. the mechanism? So I'm, I'm like, like I have spent the last 48 hours studying pretty hard what the path is for Trump to actually steal the election. And I, I came to the conclusion that the answer is there isn't one. Like, I actually think it can't, I, I mean, barring some, barring some, we can talk about what the circumstances are, but truly extraordinary circumstances, I don't think it can be done. Um, so 
there has to be some point where they say, um, uh, okay, it's over. You know, we don't, we don't like it, but Joe Biden's going to be the next president. Joe Biden got more votes. Joe Biden got more votes in the relevant states. Uh, Joe Biden has more electoral votes. Any way you want to count, we lost. What's the mechanism by which who says that? Does there have to be a mechanism where anyone says that? Well, there does because you have, you have to actually leave the White House, right? So I quoted this statute in this piece I wrote today. At some point, if you refuse to vacate the White House, you run afoul of the, the, the seditious conspiracy statute, right? The seditious conspiracy statute says if you use force to try to overthrow the government of the United States or occupy its property, you're guilty of a seditious conspiracy. At some point, you've got to allow, allow yourself to walk out that door because if you're sitting there in the White House claiming against the processes that we have to be the president, you've committed sedition. Like it's not even, I don't even think it's a close call. And, and so there's got to be some point where you and your supporters say, okay, um, I mean, let me, let me read you the statute in relevant part, because I actually think it's, it concentrates the mind a little bit. Um, okay, now imagine you're a staffer to the president and you are contemplating refusing to accept the results of an election past a certain point. And somebody were to send you uh, 18 U.S.C. 2384, which reads in relevant part, if two or more persons conspire to overthrow the government of the United States or by force to seize, take, or possess any property of the United States contrary to the authority thereof, they shall be fined each under this title or imprisoned not more than 20 years or both. Who now, was, what was the definition really quickly again at the beginning of the Yeah, individuals? it's pretty broad. Two yeah. <laughs> or more persons conspire to overthrow the government or by force to seize, take, or possess any property of the United States, say the White House, contrary to the authority thereof, they shall be fined, etc. In other words, there's a, if you trespass with the wrong intent, like the intent to, to claim the power of the presidency that you don't have, you're at least flirting with the borders of that statute. So where's the part where who says, Okay, I don't accept the results of this election, but it's over. Yeah, but who the hell's going to enforce this? How about the Secret Service at, at 12.01 on January 20th? Well, so my guess, here's my interpretation of the situation, which will take about a paragraph if you want. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. We know some things about Trump. We know that he's a very experienced litigant. We know that he very frequently uses his lawsuits. He uses them as weapons. We know that he loses lawsuits, but claims he won them anyway, and then floats on to the next thing. Um, I agree with you. There's no plausible path for him to steal the election. I also think that at some level he knows that, and all the people working for him know it. There is a theory that what he's doing right now is a kind of pantomime so that he can leave with his head hell high that he tried absolutely everything possible to resist. I don't really think that's happening either because he's humiliating himself, as Biden pointed out. I do not think he will be dragged physically from the White House. Uh, I think, in fact, he will he may boycott the inauguration, but he probably won't. I'm guessing he'll be standing there. So if all that's the case, how can what he's doing possibly make sense? That is just insisting he's still the president while allowing himself to not be the president. Well, the only way that makes sense to me is as what I described it earlier, a classic Russian style 
fire, a fire hose of falsehood disinformation campaign. These are campaigns, Putin's a master of it, but Trump is as good as anyone. People who say, well, he's an incompetent autocrat are leaving out that he is state of the art. He is world's best at disinformation. And he has been since the day he announced that his inaugural crowd was bigger than Obama's. That's him saying, fuck you. I'm in charge of truth from now on. I say whatever I please. This is about confusing and demoralizing people. This is not about convincing them that you're right. He doesn't expect to convince a lot of people that he's still president, but he does expect to confuse them about the state of things after the election. That will outrage the Democrats. It will outrage the Republicans. And most important, it ensures that after Trump is not in the White House, he can continue to be the disruptor and the mentor in chief for at least a year, maybe two years, maybe even four years. He can continue to make it impossible for the Republican Party to do the things it needs to do to stabilize and normalize. He can continue to make uh, get in the news all the time doing ridiculous shit. Um, so I think that's what he's really doing. I think it's an information warfare uh, strategy and, and really no more and no less. What do you think, Kate? I think that there's... <clears throat> I agree largely with um, with what Jonathan did. But the thing is, is that I really think that this is just as much like I think that everything he's stirring up is like just as much about like, as I said yesterday, kind of the brand and the grift and like everything else than it is about like any actually doing anything in terms of like the Secret Service taking him out. I just I just like I just like because I do know like a few people that work for him i just don't think that i mean it could be completely wrong i don't think that they would keep working for him if he did this and like i could be incorrect but like maybe that's a like um like i think that if you read the a lot of and i know like oren kerr kind of loves to take like screenshots of Fox's front page and juxtapose them against the New York Times or MSNBC about like the information ecosystem. But like people on the right are also like not kind of fomenting about this being a stolen election quite as much as you'd think they would be, at least not in the more mainstream. So like, I just feel like this is a smaller toehold than we think it is. Does that make any sense? What do you think, Jonathan? I think in terms of if you think that the result he's aiming for is to stay in the White House after January 20th, then, yeah, I don't think it's going to work. And I'm not even that worried about it. If you think that the actual product that he's looking for is to stay to be an effective troll uh, for the next year, two years and beyond to be the center of attention, to attract controversy, then it's going to work. Yeah. All right, let's talk about Mitch McConnell. Uh, but could we also just have a moment for like, even if he leaves office after doing all of this shit and it's for nothing, it's still not great. Like, it's like, it's still if, like, if the, our best case scenario is like, we still have this buffoon walking around pulling this type, this type of. Well, we seem to have uh, frozen Kate. Oh, Are no. you there? Yes. Oh, I'm here. You froze for oh. a minute. We still okay. have this buffoon. Oh, yeah, I know. That was him like reaching in and being like, it was more like this. the internet. Yeah. <laughs> um, but this is my frozen crowdcast face. <laughs> you look like Harpo Marx in the coconut. I am like Harpo Mine Marx. will be like this. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. that was scary. Have never, never do seen... that again. Wait, have I not? I can lift my bottom eyelid. It's very weird. That's okay, very good. odd, Kate. I know. Yeah, like, that's the weirdest thing about me, like, let's be honest. Um, but no, but seriously, this, like, it's not okay. I mean, like, I say this, like, okay, I'm not worried about him actually, like, staging a coup. But, like, why? Like, it's just still really baffling that we are not able to get back into a place in which Donald Trump is not going to be a part of our news cycle and captures people's people's emotions and expresses them back to them in a way that, like, gives him this really terrifying amount of momentum that does not seem to be really waning, frankly, despite despite the election results. And so, like, that terrifies me because 
that's the long term future. If he's not going to do anything about it, eventually, I think that base will. All right. I want to talk about Mitch McConnell because Mitch McConnell always makes me feel better about life, the universe and everything. Um, so Trump's behavior is it's what I named the sea turtle. Ben. you named it Mitch. No, because I like the sea turtle. <laughs> so I did not name it Mitch. How do we have an update on the sea turtle? Sea turtle's doing great. Oh, good. I called today. Yes. Excellent. So um, Mitch McConnell, uh, I, I kind of understand Trump's behavior as, you know, he's a raging narcissist. He's a, like, you know, wants to preserve his ability to be a troll. Yeah. Mitch McConnell. He seems to me to be the big winner in this event. Um, the Democrats haven't taken the Senate. He's lived to fight another day as majority leader, assuming he can hang on to one of two seats in Georgia. He's gotten rid of Donald Trump, which is not exactly, you know, you know, who is not exactly an easy uh, thing for him to manage. And he's done it without getting wiped out himself. And the Democrats have even strengthened his hand or the, the House has even strengthened his hand in negotiations with Nancy Pelosi. He seems to me to be in really good shape. And yet here he is uh, kissing Donald Trump's ass in a maximally humiliating fashion at the expense of his own credibility. How do you understand Mitch McConnell's behavior right now? Are, are you speaking this is of his a smart man? You're speaking of his behavior in not accepting the result of the election? Yeah, he can throw Donald Trump under the bus right now. Donald Trump, you know, he has his own relationship with Joe Biden. He's not this is not a this is a hey Michael. Um this is a this is a gain maximizer. He's, um, I don't understand what's in this for him. Well, I'm not a good person to impersonate Mitch McConnell, but I'm not sure why you would expect him to do that, given who he is. He's a political creature all the way down. What is the reward for him if he jumps in front of the president and the Republican base and says, Joe Biden's the president? Why not just wait and let the courts do that for him, which he assumes that they will in due course? In a month, a month from now, these lawsuits will have gone nowhere, and Trump will be a raging lunatic. And maybe, I, why would why would you jump in front of that? Now you could say statesmanship. You could say because it's the right thing to do and it's good for our democracy. But we are talking about a sea turtle. Mitch McConnell. <laughs> Um, I completely agree with John. Uh, I think that there is, there's also kind of this thing. It's like, you said this thing and it kind of struck me. It's like, this is a smart man. He is a savvy man. He uses all of his smarts for manipulation and control and like hurting, hurting. I didn't say he was a moral man. Okay. I said he's smart. But, but like people say this about Ted Cruz, right? Like Ted Cruz is a smart person. I actually believe he's probably a book smart person. And he's not like- He's you know, capable of arguing cases in front of the Supreme Court. Totally. He is not a tactically, M Mitch McConnell yeah, has Mitch a McConnell long track record of being a first rate legislative general. Uh, I'm not, you know, as, 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 um, uh, Jonathan's hero, uh, Ulysses S. Grant, said about Robert E. Lee, I admired him because he'd fought for a cause, though it happened to be one of the worst causes in my judgment that any person had ever fought for. You have to admire Mitch McConnell's capability in his role. And I like, I think he's a very capable, able leader of Senate Republicans. Yeah, my point was just that, like, the word smart doesn't really get at what the type of smart that, like, Ted Cruz is, which is very different from the type of smart that Mitch McConnell is, which is very different than the type of smart Josh Hawley is or whatever. But all of them are, like, like this is, like, this kind of craziness, I think, about intelligence that we sometimes fetishize, which is, like, oh, well, they're smart people. So they're not going to, like, what could they possibly be thinking? And there's just, like, so much there that has nothing to do 
Like Clarence Thomas is a very smart man. I just don't agree with any of his reasoning or rationale on like whatever it is that he writes about. Like there's like all of these things that go into his what he decides to do that are smart if you're Clarence Thomas and you have like a like an agenda and you want to get that agenda done. It's the same as Mitch McConnell. He has an agenda. His agenda is like Mitch McConnell and like the long term health of the Republican Party. And so in service of that end, what he's doing is very smart, but not in kind of like a the way we generally use that term sense. Well, plus in a purely tactical level, he's still got to win two Senate seats in Georgia. And if he pisses off Trump, he knows that Trump is fully capable of throwing the Senate under the bus. All right. So he has to keep Trump happy until January 5th. So let's talk about Georgia, because Georgia seems to be an interesting test case. And since we don't seem to be able to trust the polls about anything, we may as well make up the reality because it's going to be as real as realistic as anything that we can pull. So here are two theories of the Georgia case interested in your sense of which one is more accurate. One theory is every post Trump election election has followed the same pattern, which is Democrats wildly overperform except one. And that is the one where Trump is on the ballot. And so the right model for this election is 2018, where you get the kind of energized Democratic anti-Trump vote, but not the reciprocal pro-Trump vote that shows up to vote for Trump, but not for Trump-affiliated uh, Republicans. Therefore, advantage Democrats because, hey, John Ossoff almost won that district, you know, Jones beat Roy Moore, right? You can go down the list. Democrats have overperformed. And by the way, Democrats have overperformed, you know, did well in this election, right? Uh, uh, and so now you reduce the number of Trump voters, you reduce the number of Democratic voters less, and Democrats actually have a chance to win those seats. That's theory of the case number one. Theory of the case number two is Democrats are not generally competitive in Georgia. Stacey Abrams falls short, um, even in 2018. Uh, uh, you know, they did well uh, because you have this huge turnout that's against Trump that overwhelms the turnout for Trump. Both drop off and we return to Georgia normal which is that Democrats are not competitive statewide and they get 45 to 48%, but they don't get 50%. So in a straight runoff, uh, they lose. Which do you think is right? Or do you think, do you have a third theory altogether? I don't, I don't have a theory of Georgia because I don't know the state politics. That's and boring. If, at the end of the day, you do need to know the state politics, but my instincts are that it's going to be uh, number, number two that this is still a red leaning state and that a lot of Republicans are going to go to the polls knowing that control of the Senate depends on them and that there's still more of them than there are Democrats, but we'll see. I agree with that. Kate, we're agreeing on everything. I know. I'm can just we feeling, disagree? I'm just I can tell you that section like... 30 should be repealed and it would have no seriously bad consequences for the internet or anything else. Would that get you going? That's what that's what that's what you say in um the chap partly in what you say in chapter six of your book which i'm like mm. <laughs> um which has got me which has me held back from writing uh thoughts but um no i think that there's i think that it's going to be i think that what do you well actually what do you think ben do you think what do you think is going to happen in georgia i don't know my instincts about a bunch of states, Georgia included, have been wrong. I would have predicted uh, that Stacey Abrams was going to win. And I would have predicted that Trump was going to win. So if anybody had asked me, and nobody did, but if anybody asked me before both of the last two elections, uh, I would have predicted wrong. 
And so my instinct is to say, well, I predicted the last two wrong. My instinct here is consistent with both of yours, and therefore it's likely wrong. And therefore the Democrats are going to overperform. But of course, that raises the question of whether that it's that instinct that is wrong. Um, and in fact, that leads to point A. So I actually really have no idea. My, In the spirit of Jonathan and my piece that... Uh, we should uh, uh, vote out Republicans and boycott them at all levels. I just encourage people to be involved, to treat it like there's a chance of winning it, and to go in there and uh, and attack, 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 and maybe uh, maybe uh, one or both of them will fall. And the worst that happens is Mitch McConnell has a has a. 52-48 advantage in the Senate. Do we have yeah. time for me to ask you a question or do we need to go to the No, no, go ahead. the masses? Do you think it would actually be a good thing for the Democrats or the country to have a 50-50 Senate with the vice president breaking the tie or might it actually be better for the Democrats in the country if Republicans keep the Senate by a narrow margin? Here's the thinking about that. If it's a 50-50 Senate and Schumer's in charge by one vote, he's going to have to propose stuff that the Democratic base likes. And there's absolutely no reason the Republicans should go for a single drop of it ever. If McConnell is narrowly in charge of the Senate and he's got a lot of he's got a lot of seats to defend in 2020, he's vulnerable to two things. First is gangs of four, gangs of eight people who can put pressure on him by saying, well, we've got the votes now, Mr. Leader. What do you think about that? He also wants to send home some senators with some kind of positive record over the next two years. He's got to deal with the president. So maybe that's a better recipe because it forces at least some kind of compromise and some kind of bargaining on at least some things. And that's actually better than the complete stalemate we would have if he were in the minority. So I don't disagree with that in the sense that um, I think forcing McConnell into the posture in which he um, has to do business with a new president is not the craziest thing in the world. That said, um, I think you would always prefer the, you know, more power rather than less. And um, Schumer is already going to have to deal, you know, if you assume a 50-50 Senate, Schumer is already going to have to deal with Joe Manchin uh, as a kind of swing vote. Um, and I think he probably doesn't want, you know, like not having control of the floor is not a good thing in this environment. So I think he, I, I think, you know, you would always prefer to win than to lose. Um, that said, um, I'm not sure for Biden purposes that there aren't at least some advantages to, uh, you know, to a narrow minority that you can pick off uh, significant uh, for re individual votes. You can get a majority. That's my gut about it. You always want to win. If, if you're, if you're sorry, sorry, I had to disappear for a minute. That's true if you're a dumb, if you're thinking about the country and trying to get some kind of healing, some kind of trace of bipartisanship, mutuality, transactionalism over the next two to four years, maybe even if it's just the next two years. Um, look, I think the dynamics of the next two years are very different depending on who has control of the Senate. Republicans have a very bad map in 2022. So if you imagine that Mitch McConnell is running the Senate, you know, everything becomes do these vulnerable Republicans who have to face reelection, uh, you know, back the leader or do they do business with the president and Democrats? On the other hand, if Schumer's running the Senate with no margin, right, and with Kamala Harris breaking ties, uh, everything becomes, you know, uh, did you vote, uh, you know, were you loyal to your party? 
Um, and so I think it's a very different, um, uh, it's a very different environment. I definitely agree with you that there are advantages from a national, in a normal world, I would say, I agree with you. In this world, I don't. Um, I think the Republican track record over the last eight to 10 years has been brutally consistent in not looking for that compromise place. Auntie, the floor is yours from uh, Finland. Thank you, ben. So I have basically three questions. Would you like me to go with the top one or Throw whatever? them all out there and we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll do with them as we will. Okay. I, I would expect nothing less. So uh, will the lengthening list of foreign leaders congratulating Biden do anything to influence the more foreign policy minded of Republicans into sort of accepting the transition? And uh, do you think that the president's grip on the Republican Party will loosen after January, January 20th? And is there any chance whatsoever to diffuse the tension or de-escalate it as, as long as there is a, you know, a Twitter barrage from you know who going on all the time? Thanks. Jonathan, what do you think about any of those questions? I think that the endorsement of foreign leaders, including Bibi Netanyahu, which came as a surprise to me, I don't know about you, I think that clearly enhances Biden's stature. Um, I view it as kind of an assist. I think that Trump's grip on the base emotionally remains very strong. A friend of mine just went down to North Carolina to look at at the uh, the races there for a documentary he's working on. And when I said, give me the bullet points on how people feel about Trump, he said, it's very simple. The Republicans' attitude toward him in North Carolina is blind love. And I think that will continue in the base for some time. I think it's going to be very hard to be a Republican primary candidate in many, many districts if you're seen as anti-Trump and anti and against what Trump stood for. And that's going to inflect who the candidates are who run to begin with. You know, you'll get more of those Marjorie, what's her name? Marjorie something green. You'll get more of those people and they'll get in. So there's there's going to be a substantial Trump effect for years to come. And that's that's inevitable. That said, it won't be anything like what it's been when he's president. Um, he just doesn't have the power and he doesn't have the patronage. So it'll be substantially diminished. Uh, it just won't go away. But what do I know? I mean, this is like we have never been in a world remotely like this one. We have zero, yeah. zero precedent to look at here. What do you think, Kate? Yeah, no, I agree with that. I think that there's I think that. <laughs> Um, not to agree again with Jonathan, but um, I do think that there's, um, yeah, I just don't think that there's going to be a likely diminishing. I just don't see it like the 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 momentum that he had that Trump has ending anytime soon. Let's just I'll just like leave it at that. It's like I just think that there's going to be um, sources of discontent in various ways, and it's going to come out. It, like right now it's coming out with like his suits about the election and the recounts and everything else and it's and like refusing to leave possibly or or gesturing at that and firings and pardons it's going to come out and all of that and then it's going to transition into like just like taking swings from the sidelines um which is very powerful if you have the the like kind of the microphone and the amplification system that he has daniel burge back in his uh, in his chair and his mm. camouflage with his chair, but listing gently to the side um, as though it were satyr and he were uh, obliged to sit, as the Aramaic says, in a reclining position. Uh, your question, sir. Um, I'm curious about thoughts. How much do slogans matter in political campaigns? <laughs> There's been a lot of talk about whether the slogan defund the police um, hurt Democrats and congressional races. So setting aside the policy merits that might be behind those slogans, how much do slogans matter? <laughs> oh, man. John? Ben, you avoided answering the last question altogether. 
Yes, you did. And I would have I would have wanted to hear your answer. So maybe I should make you answer this one first. But I'll I'll go for it if you want me to. Well, so uh, I'm happy to. Which which one of the last question do you foreign want to foreign leaders Trump's oh, grip so on the I base? I actually think there's a there's a piece of evidence that there was a direct influence, uh, which is that uh, uh, Bob Corker, uh, uh, who um, was the uh, you know today congratulated Biden, um, and that's a seems to me to be. You know, given that he was on uh, the chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, that actually does seem to me to be likely influenced by the foreign reaction. So I, th I, I think, yeah, there probably is a relationship there. So, uh, you know, I don't it's hard to make a generic comment about how much slogans matter. And I'm not a political reporter to begin with, so I wouldn't know. But I think what's what hurt the Democrats down ballot, not so much in the big election, the presidential election, I think people were were playing for bigger stakes and had already mostly made up their minds. But down ballot, I think people voted, a lot of people showed a lot of resistance to the college educated, predominantly white, woke, anti-racist, defund police, kind of democratic liberalism. And we saw that resistance apparently from Hispanics, from African-Americans, at least African-American men, and it looks like one of the reasons that the Democrats lost seats in the House is that people discovered that they're able to vote against Trump because he's a monster, but also vote against empowering Democrats who people thought had gone over the edge with radicalized woke nonsense. Yeah. My hope is that the Democrats, assuming that's what happened, we don't really have detailed exit polls and exit polls may be bad this year anyway. But if that's what the story is, and if we're seeing a recoil from radical wokeness, and if, in fact, it's, it's always the case that when the voters get to weigh in on radical wokeness, they never like it. If all of that is the case, my hope is that that is a useful warning shot to Democrats not to let themselves be taken over by the upper middle class, white, college educated, Twitter bubble, woke section of their base. Um. I think that the idea that people are pushing back on with slogans is fascinating. I think that people forget the Black Lives Matters too, like had two kind of iterations uh, that were a couple of years apart, like it kind of died down as a slogan for a while and then came back. Um, it was like kind of was uh, really, um, really prolific and like, like began in 2016 and then kind of came back this year with George Floyd. And I think that there's, and it had a different, a totally different take up, even though the, like the, like the slogan remained the same. And this is because the problem with slogans and the problem with using them for political movements that have real policy actions is that if you're moving, trying to move the Overton window of things and with like your wokeness is that you're going to be talking to people using these radical way way like on like a like a like a nine on like a scale of 10 of like kind of things that you could say even when what you're really seeking is just to change from like four to five on like the policy scale or four to six you don't actually want what you're saying you want far less but you put it out there because you're hoping that people will hit somewhere in between or you're kind of saying it and this is what I heard a lot from people of friends of mine who had the defund police thing that they were like putting in their Twitter profile and whatever. I was like, well, I don't actually believe that we should defund the police. It's not something I actually think. Um, and I was like, then like, why are you saying that? And they're like, well, that's not what the slogan means. And so there's this social meaning behind the words that are completely separate from the words. And like, that is a really confusing shitty way to run a slogan and so like it's not really doing its job um the whole point of the slogan is kind of like there should be some universal understanding of what is being what the slogan stands for um and that is exactly the opposite of what defund the police had and so i think that that's my main kind of that was like my main problem with defund the police that there are like people wanted a lot of police reform, which I was completely in favor of. I was not in favor of whole wholeheartedly like defunding the police, which I thought was batshit crazy. Um, and um, 
you know, but that's kind of like, that's what, how I saw it playing out in front of me. Gray yeah, Harris. Someone, I just wanted to All mention right. someone, some academic, sorry, Gray, I'll be, I'll, you'll be, this will take 10 seconds. An academic did a study evaluating the proposition that taking radical positions moves the Overton window in such a way that that's constructive in the long run, even if people hate it. And what he found, or what they found was that it is true that moving the Overton window in that way makes the unsayable more sayable and has a long-term effect of shifting the conversation, which may be what activists want. Unfortunately, in the short and medium term, it also loses you the elections. And a which complaint is exactly with the left is that they have put yeah. far too little emphasis on winning elections. Sorry. Oh, no, you're No, fine. I love that point. And like, but that's exactly why I was trying to kind of like bring up the Black Lives Matter things at the, at the head of this, of my response. Because what you saw was like people had the same type of sloganeering anti response of like, why do I need to be told that Black Lives Matter? Are you saying that we think that Black Lives don't matter? Like, what is this? And but it was a slogan that people like, why, what's wrong with all lives matter, blue lives matter, this whole thing that went back and forth. And what it was, was like this dog whistling of like these various movements that were like meaning different things than what they said. Um, and, uh, and, but by the time in I, I think this year, when the, the phrase, the slogan came back, it had settled into our consciousness. It had normalized in a way that it really, that people could get behind it. And it was like it, the Overton window had moved a little from that radical conversation um, that we had had in 2016, 2017. All right, Gray, this time for real. The floor is yours. All right, thank y'all. Uh, so credit to Eric Michael Garcia on Twitter for kind of positing this idea. But uh, the concept of, well, and, and let me preface this, I don't know that it would crystallize until probably three and a half years from now, but the, the idea that Trumpism, MAGA, would become the new lost cause. And so like a MAGA hat would become representative of the Confederate flag. Um, anyway, just kind of thoughts on maybe where that is going. If that, if you know, y'all kind of thought that would be the new lost cause. Thanks. I buy this completely. Yeah, I think, 100%. I think one of the things that Trump has done really successfully is he's created a wistfulness about himself and his racism in a way that is reminiscent of the lost cause myth. And um, I think, you know, when I drive around rural Virginia, which I do a lot, um, there is, first of all, uh, Confederate flags fly alongside American flags and Trump signs on a very consistent basis. I mean, it's it's not that all Trump signs have Confederate flags, but all Confederate flags have Trump signs associated with them. And mm. secondly, and more importantly, I think there's a very consistent, uh, you know, this, this Make America Great Again invokes a time when, uh, in a way that is, uh, uh, nostalgic in very much the same way that the lost cause myths are nostalgic. And I think all of these movements have nostalgia associated with them. And um, Trump is one of them. He's inarticulate. He's, um, he's not eloquent, but he is, uh, he does stand for that. And I, I think there's a reason I think it is very likely to be remembered in a way that is very fond in that world. That all seems right to me. Um, a way to put that in a, in a broader frame is that what's happened politically over the past few years is a massive consolidation of support for Democrats in major urban centers that are at the forefront of the globalized information era economy, the college educated, and so on. They came, they were 70% this time of the, of the um, counties. 
that uh, I should say of, of the counties that produce 70 percent of the GDP, uh, they went for uh, they went for Biden. That's even bigger than they went for Hillary Clinton. And meanwhile, the exurbs and rural America are consolidating in a big way as the resistance to all of the things that those cosmopolitan elites and economies in the city stand for. And they are turning MAGA and Trump into the symbol of that resistance to this world. And that's become the great cultural divide of our politics. And it's a race to see which coalition can form up fastest, the Democrats with their minorities and their college educated, uh, both of which are increasing. But the Republicans, it turns out, have done a very good job, a surprisingly good job of discovering new votes and voters and mobilizing people in rural and exurban America much faster, much more than people expected. So it's it's a race. And these cultural symbols are, are right at the heart of it. Esther, the penultimate question is yours. Hi, thanks for coming back. Uh, I want to return to the constitution of knowledge that you talked about in the previous episode. And I have a concern uh, or just a niggling concern about the notion of professionalism in terms of the distillation of expert knowledge and essentially the institutionalization uh, of an impediment to fundamentally new ways of thinking. And I, I do get that within the model, the whole idea of new ways of thinking would be they would be distilled down to expert knowledge, but I just, you know, when do we know that it's time to deinstitutionalize, and when is the institution so strong that these new ways of thinking are just really squashed? Anyway, what, just a what a fantastic question. Interestingly, it's the second time it's come up in the last few days, so this must be a real uh, a real sticking point. So, a couple things to say about that. One is professionalism is not the same as expertise. Professionalism has to do with not so much necessarily as what do I know in this situation, but is there a right thing for someone like me to do in this situation? For a lawyer, for example, in this situation, is there a way I'm supposed to behave regardless of my personal preferences? And that becomes very important for maintaining um, social continuity and getting things done in ways that are not like the way Donald Trump wants to do them. The bigger answer to this question is, I'm a homosexual American, until 1973, I was considered mentally ill by the psychiatric profession. I have not forgotten that. This is scarring for all gay people of my generation and older. One reason no one came out, people were terrified of being mentally ill. So I am very well up to speed on the fact that professions can become stultified and insular and make and politicized without even realizing it because it happened. What's the answer to that? Well, diversity, in my opinion, and that's a big theme of the constitution of knowledge. It is very important for all of these systems to do what they need to do and go out of their way to make sure there's intellectual diversity, viewpoint diversity within the professions. And as the book will argue, one of the big areas of concern in modern academia is that there are departments and disciplines where intellectual diversity, viewpoint diversity is simply inadequate and sufficient efforts to ensure it are not being made. And where diversity is inadequate, you get dogma masquerading as knowledge. So thank you for that wonderful question. David Botts, you get the last question. Thank you, Ben. Um, and thank you, Mr. Roush. Um, what are your thoughts about the, can the cancel culture that we are currently experiencing? And in your estimation, is this, is this new or simply sort of more of the same? And are we throwing stones from glass houses if we decide to cancel 45? What do you mean by cancel 45? Well, to, um, I, I guess, sort of beyond a rejection of, of, the, um, of the policy and the, de and the decisions, but to be overly uh, derisive and uh, negative, um, for, for him and, and, what, and what he stood for. <clears throat> well, so canceling is a specific thing, and I don't think that 45 is vulnerable to it. Canceling has to do with using social coercion and intimidation and especially pressure on people like employers and professional associates to turn someone into a social outcast, make it difficult, if not impossible, 
for them to make a living, deplatform them, et cetera. And none of that is going to happen to Donald Trump. I, I can assure you of that. So is cancel culture more of the same or is it something new? The answer is yes. It's more of the same in the sense that social coercion in order to deplatform, silence, intimidate, and isolate social and political opponents goes back time immemorial. And again, it was done to gay people. The big enforcement of the closet was if you're outed as gay, you lose your job the next day and no one wants to associate with you and everyone turns their back and you have to find a new town. So that's old. But yes, it's also new. Some some important things have happened just recently. One is social media made it very, very easy to organize mobs literally in seconds. And that's new. That used to take a lot of effort. It was very hard to do and didn't usually work. The second thing that's new is the cancelers discovered their secret weapon is that employers are very malleable and professional associates are very malleable. And in a labor market, you know, there's always an alternative to Ben Wittes. If you can, if he's made controversial, uh, well, there are 10 other people who can do that. Yeah. So, I've, so why I, keep them I around? I keep trying to hire one of them myself. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, and, and so the, um, the soft spot of employment pressure on employers and professionals and the fact that they almost always cave, that has greatly empowered cancel culture. That takes it to the next level where it's not just criticism. Uh, it's not even just being disliked. It's can you make a living anymore? We are going to leave it there because uh, one thing we are certainly not doing on In Lieu of Fun is making a living, um, <laughs> whatever else we may be doing. Um, Jonathan Roush, you're a great American. Uh, Thanks for uh, having me. Kate Klonick owes me a phone call. Let's set that up. Come back anytime. Set Kate, that up. Yeah, Kate will give you a call. Kate, have, I have your guess, person call my person. Who's your guest? I don't who's our guest person. for tomorrow? Uh, David French. David French. Um, That'll be fun. He's he's a god in living form. He is a god in living form. Although I he quite quite like that man. Yes, yeah. I'm. Um... I am very pro David French. Um, that will be twenty two hours and fifty seven minutes from now. And until then, Kate. We don't have fun anymore. But Ben is um, a morbidly obese and terribly bad looking man and you can't sue crowdcast for me saying that, <laughs> that nice hat all true <laughs> um uh all true uh it's actually there's a defense there's no liability there because it is truth is an absolute defense down. against libel i've only seen you from here up so like from here down i could be completely you know if I, I know? if i showed the morbid <laughs> obesity Virginia Heffernan would say it was I was being nipply and weird. Um, ben is like Mycroft Holmes. He never leaves that chair. His, only his mind leaves yeah. that chair. Correct. We yeah, will see you exactly. tomorrow. Except when he's at the Diogenes Club.